My name is Jose Casanova, and I'm a senior fellow here at the Center. And it is a great pleasure to welcome Peter Berger, a friend of old, not an old friend, but a friend of old, personal. Also old friend. Yes, an old friend, personal, and also friend of the Berkeley Center. Uh, Peter Berger is one of these persons who truly does not need an introduction, but I cannot resist the temptation to say a few words about him. Uh, he uh, trained a whole generation of sociologists like me with uh, invitation to sociology was basically a personal invitation which many of us got and became sociologists through it. And then the social construction of reality, of course, remains a classic in an age in which the notion that reality is socially constructed and the construction constructions well about 50 years ago uh, Peter Berger and Thomas Lukman wrote the real version of what the social construction of reality mean uh, then of course he was Mr. Uh, secularization theory the sacred canopy was the most important book in American sociology and secularization theory anticipated much of the discourse on religious markets and so on that later would become so paramount and then, however, wrote the desecularization of the world, apparently uh, reversing completely himself, and yet he is not reversing himself. He has continued uh, rethinking those issues, and today he is going to offer probably the latest version of his rethinking on those issues. But besides the sociology of religion, uh, he was the founder of the Institute for Economic Culture, continuing the work of Max Weber on issues of economy and religion and interrelations that became eventually CURA, the Center for the Study of uh, uh, Religion and International Affairs, and has done work on South Africa and China, the uh, Confucianism and the Chinese Tigers, and Brazil, and Latin America, Pentecostalism, and basically remains one of the most important uh, social thinkers of today, and we are very, very much pleased and honored to have you here, Peter. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm very pleased that uh, Jose is chairing this session. And I think I can begin this, my remarks by uh, paying homage to Jose and at the same time using him to, in a nutshell, sum up what I'm going to talk about. Um, I have enormous respect for Jose's work. But some of you, I'm sure, know his, or probably most of you know, his early work on religion and public life, where he did an enormous service by really taking apart the concept of secularization. You may remember he broke it up into three different meanings, uh, the first of which is uh, social differentiation, uh, namely that uh, with modern modernization of societies, um, uh, institutions become differentiated where previously they were not and that affects religion like everything else. So you have instead of having a kind of uh, unified institutional complex in which of which religion is a part, you now have church and state and the economy and the state and edu uh, ex excuse me, church and state and uh, uh, church and education, religion and the family and so forth, a differentiation. Uh, and what uh, Jose, I think, fair to say, had in mind, and what most of us got from him, was to think of, sec of this, this type of secularization, this aspect of secularization, as an institutional phenomenon, like church and state, etc. And what only struck me much more recently is that after I'm supposed to be Mr. Sociology of Knowledge, and a very simple, basic sociological, uh, sociology of knowledge insight, which frankly hadn't occurred to me before. And the insight is very simple. Uh, any institutional differentiation must have a correlate in consciousness. That's sociology of knowledge 101. Uh, in other words, we have in terms of church and state, we have the First Amendment in the US Constitution, which still keeps zillions of federal judges busy seven days a week figuring out just what it means in what context. What I'm saying is, to stay with that example, there must also be a first amendment of the mind. And if it is possible to separate church and state in the institutional order of a society, it must also be possible within the minds of individual to have a differentiation between that aspect of their life 
which is secular and that aspect which is religious. Uh, it's a very simple statement, but I hadn't thought of it before. And it has enormous implications. And what I'm going to talk about is essentially a report on work in progress. It's something I started about a year ago. And um, uh, I find it extremely interesting, and I think it has very interesting implications. Now, uh, also I should mention, uh, it pleases me, I, I have very bad arthritic knees, and for a while I thought that my brain may well go the way of my knees, and it pleased me a lot that it hasn't so far. Um, uh, I, uh, since I just celebrated my 105th birthday, as you know, I'm very pleased that my brain is much more agile than my knees. Now, um, as Jose pointed out, I began, and I was not at all alone, almost everyone else in, in sociology and history of, of religion had the same notion when I started my work, like 180 years ago, uh, I assumed circularization theory which again can be summed up very simply, more modernity, less religion. Uh, it wasn't completely crazy. In many ways, what we did then, we who operated with this concept in the 50s and 60s, um, well, had some reasons for saying what we did. But there are some things we didn't see. And I would say secularization theory, in its most ample formulation, that, the mo that religion necessarily declines with modernization, I would say that theory has been pretty much falsified. I live in Greater Boston, which has more academics per square foot than any other place on Earth, so we get some pretty sophisticated bumper sticker stickers, and one which I saw in Cambridge a couple of years ago, it was a very short little bumper sticker, it said, Dear Mr. Nietzsche, you are dead, dead. yours very truly, God. Uh, which. I think is, is a good statement of the development of theories of religion. Now, um, uh, okay, uh, I mentioned the basic notion of secularization, uh, of secularity being not an all-embracing concept, but a sector, both of society and of um, in the consciousness of individuals. Um, and uh, another way of uh, putting this insight is to say that religion and secularity are not necessarily a question of either or. Now, it can be a question of either or. I mean, if you have a, I don't know, a member of a contemplative order who spends all his or her life in prayer uh, with occasional, perhaps mystical experiences, it may well be that religion is an all-encompassing in reality for this individual. But I think that is not the case with most people who, um, uh, who are religious. Um, I think next to Jose, I think in Spanish terms. So if you have someone like Teresa of Avila or some of the great mystics uh, who also had to negotiate between uh, her ecstasies and her I believe, busy administrative functions uh, reforming the Carmelite order. Um, but I think it's fair to say that for someone like Teresa, uh, her religion embraced everything else she did. It was a kind of, to use one term I've used, a kind of all-embracing canopy over her life. But that is not the case with most ordinary Catholics. Not, uh, I think it was not the case with ordinary Catholics in, the, uh, in Teresa's age, and even less so today. Uh, they may be pious Catholics, they may uh, even be conservative theologically, uh, but at the same time, uh, they are computer engineers and uh, business people and airline pilots. And uh, while they are engaged in these occupations, necessarily their religious world is bracketed. Uh, so I think, uh, if we think, if I now think of secularization or secularity, it is not an either or in terms of religion. It can, in much of the time, it is both. And uh, the relationship between these two sectors in society and in the mind 
between the religious sector and the secular sector is what now fascinates me. And what I have been saying for a while is that um, quite some years ago that I decided secularization theory of the old kind doesn't, doesn't stand up. Um, but what uh, modernity does not necessarily produce secularity or secularization. But what I think modernity pretty necessarily produces is pluralism. And I have had the thought that uh, if we are going to give up the old secularization theory, or at least substantially modify it, what we need is a theory of pluralism, not just religious pluralism. It's much broader than religion, but religion is part of that pluralistic dynamic. And I think it necessarily is the result of modernity. Doesn't mean it can't be suppressed. Uh, it can be, uh, though it has enormous costs if people try to suppress it. If you want to suppress pluralism in a society, uh, you have to set up pretty much a totalitarian system, uh, which controls all communications, which prevents uh, any kind of social bodies emerging which are not controlled by the state and represent the state's ideology. This can be done. It is being done even today in some places, uh, North Korea being an obvious example, but at enormous cost. Uh, not only enormous human costs, because totalitarianism pretty much correlates with some kind of terroristic uh, regime, uh, but also economic costs. I mean, uh, uh, you cannot uh, interact in a productive way with the world economy running that kind of society. So, um, uh, yes, you can suppress pluralism, but you pay an enormous price for it. And um, most countries in the world today, greater or lesser enthusiasm, uh, try to live with pluralism in one way or another. Um, let me say a few things of what influenced me greatly in my recent thinking on this. One was my, um, not just my um, interest, it was the institute of, our institute's interest, um, we've been fascinated by global Pentecostalism, uh, which is, I think, probably the most explosive, explosively growing movement in the history of religion. Unbelievable development, uh, which some of you, I'm sure, are very familiar, although uh, uh, David Martin, who's sort of the dean of Pentecostal studies, or pioneer of Pentecostal studies, wrote a little book about the revolution that was not supposed to happen. Uh, intellectuals don't like Pentecostalism. No, not just in the United States. They don't like it in, in, in other parts of the world. They didn't, this is a revolution that wasn't supposed to happen. It's now so huge that it's very difficult to deny. Now, um, if, you develop, if you enter into the Pentecostal world, which is not my world, but I'm empathetic, uh, with any degree of um, curiosity, uh, what strikes one, I think, is that, it, that people in this world very effectively combine a, a very supernaturalist religion uh, with um, very successful, usually within limits if they're very poor people, uh, attempts to uh, to have social mobility into a modernizing society. And uh, David Martin, among other people, and I, I agree with him, uh, to see Pentecostalism as essentially a modernizing phenomenon. And uh, one can go into great detail describing the structure of this, uh, put it in terms of an image, uh, <coughs> at the center of Pentecostalism in most of the world is healing not just healing in a spiritual sense, but physical healing, uh, and in some instances, raising people from the dead. Let's not go into the question to what extent this is real or, or, or a fantasy, but if people believe it, it is real to them. And at the same time, uh, I think one can make a very good case that much of Pentecostalism uh, uh, is a uh, renewal, a replication of what Max Weber wrote about as the Protestant ethic. Um, just to give you one uh, anecdote, 
the last uh, very full national study we did of Pentecostalism out of our institute at Boston University was in South Africa. And uh, it was a very, very interesting study. And uh, we, we published a little book in South Africa. I don't think it was much noticed anywhere else. And we had a press conference, um, which was also very interesting. Uh, almost all the black uh, journalists had Pente Pentecostals in their families, and the couple were Pentecostal. None of the whites, not only were they not Pentecostal, they knew very little about it, which is interesting. Well, we, some of us went to um, a big Pentecostal mega church on the outskirts of Johannesburg called the Rema Church, uh, which was fascinating. And uh, uh, one of the details, it was a huge church. There were about 7,000 people at every service, uh, four every Sunday, three, uh, in, no, two in English and two in African languages, as I recall. The congregation, was, was, when we went that Sunday, about 85% black, 15% uh, white and colored and everything else, which is about the national proportion. And it went on for endlessly mind blowing, noisy music. And then came the preacher, who was white, or was then, this is about three years ago, uh, by background a bodybuilder, a kind of Pentecostal Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and uh, he had a very charismatic sermon. And uh, the sermon had two themes. One was, God does not want you to be poor, which I think he quite consciously said, we didn't interview him, uh, compared with the Catholic notion of a preferential option for the poor. God doesn't want you to be poor. And secondly, you can do something about it. And what he thought you could do about it was uh, Weberian, if you will. In fact, the church has a little business school. It was a Sunday, so the school was closed, but we got a brochure. And of course, they don't train people to work for a multinational corporation, but to run a little business, a, a beauty salon or a garage or whatever. How, how do you do this? Um, well, we left, and none of us there were, um, were uh, personally involved in that kind of religion. In fact, the woman who is in charge of the, um, of the uh, center with which we work in South Africa is, uh, is a very secular Jew, and, and I called her, uh, well, I said she's religiously tone deaf. Uh, and they were terribly excited, and she was very excited by the sermon. And uh, we asked ourselves, do we quarrel with this message? And we all said, no, no, I don't think God wants people to be poor. If they are poor, if you're a Christian, you think God will be with you and make, help you cope with your misfortune. But God doesn't want you to be poor. And there are things you can do about poverty. We know pretty much what they are. Easier done in some places than others. Um, Okay, uh, Pentecostalism and modernity is a topic from which I learned a lot. And then I've had very intense contact with the world of American evangelicalism for a very simple reason that uh, three times a year I teach uh, at Baylor University in Texas, which is Southern Baptist, or Texas Baptist. They don't like to be called Southern Baptist. <laughs> I'm not sure of the nuances of the difference. Um, and it's a different world. I mean, going from Boston to Waco, Texas is like traveling from Stockholm to Sicily. Uh, and uh, it's very pleasant, and I have uh, uh, lots of interesting conversations. And um, uh, it became very clear to me that uh, it's not a coincidence that the Bible Belt overlaps with the Sun Belt. Uh, uh, this heavily evangelical culture it's not exclusively, it's pluralistic, but heavily evangelical, uh, is, uh, has been for many years one of the most dynamic regions in the American economy. And I increasingly think this is not an accident. And there are a number of uh, conversations. One has, um, uh, I have this evangelical language much in my head now. When people uh, make a decision, they say they will pray over it. Uh, something happens which... Uh, I would regard as a coincidence. They say, I think we are being shown something. In other words, this is a very supernaturalist world. And at the same time, uh, uh, people in this world are extremely rational in terms of their economic behavior, in terms of um, uh, the way they organize their life, uh, from medicine to 
education of uh, educational interest for their children. Um, um, uh, there is a secular world in and uh, in that society. First Amendment includes Texas, uh, but it's also in the minds of people in that society, and it's that relationship between the mind and the institutions uh, which interests me. And then last year, um, uh, I read two books which I strongly recommend to you. Um, um, which uh, uh, really deal with the same topic. One is by an anthropologist by the name of Tanya Lerman. I don't know how you pronounce her name. I've never met her. It's L-U-H-R-M-A-N. She teaches at Stanford. And she wrote a book published last year uh, called When God Talks Back, The American Evangelical Experience with God. And what she did, um, uh, she never quite tells you what her own beliefs are, except she's of sort of mainline Protestant background, but to what extent she, anthropologists often go native, to what extent she went native with her subjects, she doesn't tell us. And you can't tell, she's, she listened to them. Uh, and she studied something called the Vineyard Fellowship, which is a charismatic, uh, basically evangelical uh, uh, outfit originated in California as part of the so-called Jesus movement in the late 60s and 70s. And uh, she, in great detail, went into the experience which these people claim to have. Uh, and um, uh, what comes through very clearly is, again, these are people who manage to uh, combine a very supernaturalistic worldview in which God, and also incidentally the devil, but God is more interesting to them, uh, constantly intervenes. And at the same time, they function very well in a modern society and have internalized many of the assumptions, the cognitive uh, structures of the modern world. Uh, the, fun, the funniest chapter, not the fun, funniest, but in the sense of laughing, but what I thought was a real fun chapter in Lerman's book is entitled, Are They Crazy? And what she did, they talk to people who, empirically speaking, aren't there. Okay? They have conversations with God, uh, which uh, many modern psychiatrists would regard as a sign of schizophrenia. Uh, so she, in a rather pedantic way, lists the major symptoms of schizophrenia as modern psychiatry uh, sees them, and then concludes they don't meet these criteria. Whatever they are, they are not crazy in a psychiatric sense. Uh, I still have time. I can't resist the temptation of telling you another episode. Uh, many years ago, uh, involuntarily, I served some years in the American Army and uh, happened to be assigned as a social worker to a military hospital, uh, to a psychiatric clinic of a military hospital. That was in Georgia. And uh, one of my colleagues was, uh, was a sociologist from, uh, from the South. And the chief psychiatrist came from Michigan. And we would sit for hours with not too many patients and had coffee in the kitchen and talked. And uh, <laughs> this psychiatrist from Michigan came in and addressed my colleague, who was a southerner, said, you know, I have this patient uh, that today who talks to Jesus every morning. I said, if I were back in Michigan, I would say he's psychotic. But things are different here, aren't they? <laughs> and <coughs> my colleague said, absolutely. We have people here who talk to, who talk to Jesus every morning. Uh, doesn't mean anything psychiatrically. Um, OK, that's Lerman's book, which I warmly recommend to you. Uh, the other book is by somebody I know quite well. Some of you know him well, Robert Wathnow, a uh, sociologist at Princeton, uh, who wrote a recent book uh, called The God Problem which deals very much with the same issue, except he uses a different language. Uh, Lerman uses some kind of what she calls psychological or anthropological psychology. I'm not quite sure what that means. Basically, it's an anthropological approach, ethnographic approach. Uh, Was now uses what he calls discourse analysis. But th the result is very much the same. It's, it's people who are intensely religious, uh, he only uh, dealt with Christians, as I recall. Um, 
uh, but who at the same time are uh, very much involved in the modern world, uh, both in their actions and in their thinking. Uh, he uses uh, uh, nice terminology that his, his interview is used. So they're religious, but they don't want to be weird or wacko. And uh, what is weird or wacko? And one example he gives, which is interesting, you may, some of you may re remember that, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, famous evangelist who has his headquarters in Virginia. Uh, Robert? Orwell? No, uh, Robertson? Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson, yeah. Uh, he claimed at some point that he <coughs> spent, I think, a night praying and diverted the course of a hurricane which was moving toward his headquarters and it went somewhere else. Wilmington. Uh, pardon me? Wilmington. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, they, his <laughs> Wasner's respondents said, that's weird. That's not how we are religious, like changing the direction of a hurricane so that it would destroy somebody else's home rather than yours. Um, again, I think the result uh, uh, of that study is very much uh, like Lerman's. The coexistence of uh, religion and secularity in uh, the same uh, mind. Uh, Charles Taylor, by the way, had a somewhat similar term, except his frame of reference is hard for me to, to, uh, to absorb. But in his book, The Secular Age, he talks about the imminent frame, uh, which is a, a frame of looking at reality in imminent terms, as in secular terms. And he also, as, as I recall, uses the term that it's a de default discourse. And when people fall back upon it, if nothing else intervenes. So, for example, one of very charismatic Christian who believes in uh, spiritual healing uh, um, will go to a service where in the hope of being healed from whatever ails this individual. Um, uh, but at the same time, the default discourse, if he immediately gets sick today, his first call will be to a doctor or a clinic, not to the charismatic healer. In that sense, default. The secular discourse is a default discourse, which we all know about and fall back upon uh, when nothing else intervenes. And in this case, what might intervene, that, that one of his fellow charismatic followers says, uh, you really must come to the healing service on Saturday because so-and-so uh, is very good at healing. So what I am very much involved in now is to uh, develop a theory of pluralism um, to, um, in a, not to, well, you could say to substitute what secularization tried to do as an explanation of the modern world, but substitute is a slightly too strong term to substantially modify that concept of modernity. And in terms of intellectual influences, I would say what I'm trying to do, I'm writing a little book about this now, and we have an, uh, two projects in our institute that deals with this in different ways, um, with uh, working groups of people who have competences which I lack, um, historical com competences, for example. Uh, what I have in mind is a theoretical wedding between two uh, uh, writers. One is Alfred Schütz who very much influenced me in many things I did. He was also my teacher. And the other one, the less well-known, Shmuel Eisenstadt, the recently uh, deceased Israeli sociologist. And more specifically, uh, Schutz's concept of multiple realities and uh, uh, Eisenstadt's concept of multiple modernities. And to bring these two together, I found uh, great fun uh, and very instructive. Well, I can't give you a lecture now on Schutz and Eisenstadt. Let me just very s briefly summarize how I want to use this. Uh, uh, Schutz's work is a enormously detailed phenomenology of everyday life. What are the cognitive structures of everyday life? And um, uh, he makes an interesting distinction that the terminology is not very happy, I think, um, between what he calls the paramount reality and finite provinces of meaning. The paramount reality is the reality in which we are most of the time 
Uh, it's the world of ordinary, everyday experience uh, in which most of our actions are based and which we share with most people. We are wide awake, I would say right now, unless I've been so uh, eloquent that you have escaped into an ecstatic, finite province of meaning, unlikely. We are in an academic situation very much part of everyday life. For most of us, the main part of everyday life is academic occasions. Um, but then there are these finite provinces of meaning where we emigrate temporarily from the paramount reality. Uh, Schütz was Viennese, therefore was very interested in the theater. The theater is, comes back as an example. Uh, uh, the lights become dark, the curtain goes up, you are sucked into a different world, which is the world of this play. If it's a good play, if you're not, if you sleep or chat with your neighbor, then you are not in the finite province of meaning. But in the play, and then Schutz analyzes the different structures uh, of the cognitive structures of this kind of reality. There's a different sense of time. It takes 10 minutes on the stage. It's three years in the play, a different space, you're in Washington, the play is in, I don't know, in, in, in China, and so on and so forth. Different experiences of self, a different world. And that's certainly true of religious experience, mystical, ecstatic religious experience, which Schutz, by the way, was totally uninterested in. He <coughs> hardly ever talks about religion. But you can apply it to this kind of religious experience. Teresa of Avila would be a perfect example. Mystic, uh, ecstatic. Uh, emigration from the paramount reality. But then there's another concept of, um, and that's not very applicable to the, uh, <laughs> think of this French, French term as the, the au moyen sexuel, the mid medium sexual individual. You could say the au um, uh, 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 moyen uh, religieux, who is the computer engineer who goes to mass, okay? Um, Multiple realities doesn't quite apply to this character. But another Schutzian concept does, which is relevant structures. We exist with different relevant structures. And uh, what is relevant in one situation is irrelevant in another. Um, give you a couple of very, n n much more broad than religion. We do it all the time. Uh, the example I gave in the article I wrote on this, which, by the way, if you're interested in, was published in Society magazine in the July-August 2012 issue. May as well stay with that example. Uh, say you go to an art gallery and you are uh, very much taken with the picture that's exhibited there. Uh, you have an intense aesthetic experience. The picture sort of sucks you in. And for a moment you forget where you are. You're in that picture. And then you happen to notice the picture is for sale, and you notice it, the price. And suddenly it occurs to you, hmm, this might be a good investment, OK? What have you done at that moment? Very ordinary. You have moved from an aesthetic to an economic relevant structure. Very ordinary. We do it all the time. I give 20 examples without thinking very much. Uh, religion can be that kind of relevant structure. Uh, and you move from one relevance to another as you go to church and as you leave the church, uh, 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 as you pray and as you do your income tax returns, and so on and so forth. That is where Schutz, and one can go into much more detail on this, where Schutz is very useful. Uh, and Schutz deals with consciousness. All of Schutz's work is a detailed phenomenology of consciousness, very much in the tradition of uh, Husserl. Uh, Eisenstadt didn't do that uh, hardly at all. Uh, and what he meant by multiple modernities is uh, it was a polemical concept against <laughs> an overly ethnocentric Western notion of modernity. Uh, Eisenstadt was quite witty, but he didn't use that example. But let me use it. I, I used to call it the electric toothbrush theory of modernization or development. It was drop an electric toothbrush into the Amazonian jungle, and in one generation it'll look like Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, inevitable kind of process. Uh, 
uh, which um, uh, Eisenstein, I think, quite correctly said, is a mistake. Uh, sure, there are certain elements of modernity uh, which will be the same whether you're in the middle of Brazil or in, 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 in Pennsylvania. Uh, it have to do with science, technology, bureaucracy, and a lot of other structures of modernity. But um, uh, we talked about this, well, Jose talked about this an hour ago. Uh, Brazil is not like Pittsburgh. And what you have in a number of places in the world, you have a development of a modern society, <coughs> increasingly modern society, with very different cultural traits. And you see this in China, in India, in Africa. Uh, in fact, even within Europe, you have quite different uh, types of modernity, more similar to each other than they would be, say, to China. But uh, Sweden is not like Spain. Uh, even England is not like France. Uh, uh, modernity doesn't come in a single model. It comes in different models. That was Eisenstadt's uh, great point. Now, Eisenstadt, uh, <laughs> like Schutz, wasn't terribly interested in religion, so he does talk about it here and there. But uh, it's very applicable, of course, to religion. And in much of the world today, it is a burningly important political problem. Let me concretize this. For many people in the world, a very important problem is how can I be a believing and practicing Muslim. And then another question is, what would it mean to have an Islamic modernity? Okay? Uh, people are not only struggling over this, they are killing each other over this. Uh, what would be, what can be, empirically, <coughs> never mind what you think theologically, the Koran uh, uh, let, lets you to, to, to think, but empirically, what would an Islamic modernity look like? Uh, probably not a single model. There may be different models, but what they would have in common, they would be clearly Islamic in inspiration, but also modern. There are analogies in the Western world. Christian democracy, as it developed after World War II, is a very good example of an attempt at a Christian, originally very strongly Catholic modernity. And it became increasingly clear what that means. Um, so I want to marry Schutz and uh, uh, Eisenstadt. Perfect couple. Uh, a perfect couple. Um, uh, they, neither was religious as far as I know, but um, uh, if they meet in heaven, they may chuckle over <laughs> this, this suggestion. Um, well, I think I've more or less come to the end of what I wanted to say. Um, well, uh, uh, stick with the, with the example of the, the Muslim individual and the question of an Islamic modernity. Um, uh, this is not an esoteric topic that no one thinks about. It's constantly being thought about, not just by Muslims, but by people who look at the Muslim world and are concerned about the way it will develop. Uh, but these two problems are usually looked at separately. There is the individual psychological problem, problem of individual faith, belief, and practice. And there is the political problem of how to manage uh, religion uh, in a modern society, uh, increasingly pluralistic society, uh, and it becomes, of course, very acute if at the same time you wanted to have a democratic state. How is that to be arranged? Uh, probably not as sort of carbon copies of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, uh, translated into Arabic or Chinese. It's not going to be that way. But how can it be? How can we envisage it? And how perhaps in some places is it being attempted? This linkage of the personal and the political, not heaven forbid the way this was argued in the 60s, I don't mean it that way at all, but the personal and the political belong together in a theory of pluralism. Part of modernity is to have a very rational organization of time, so I was told 40 minutes, it's 40 minutes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we thought we will have 
we'll give you plenty of time for uh, um, questions, but I wanted to raise a few issues, which I think that come from these from these uh, really really uh, exciting, uh, uh, insightful lecture. I think that the way in which you are rethinking the issue of pluralization versus secularity, um, and go back to playing a bit, not so much the devil's advocate, but look yes. at uh, the consequences. I mean, Peter Berger not only has now talked of multiple structures of consciousness, a la uh, Schutz and multiple uh, modernities, a la Eisenstadt, but also he wrote with, Eis with um, Huntington, the infamous Huntington of the class of civilizations, a book on multiple globalizations, which again, basically is a way of, of also saying that we have to look at this as a multiple process. But the interesting question is where does Europe fit in here precisely? The paradox. Where does Europe fit in? Europe. The paradox. If the immanent frame, I'm going to use, or the social differentiation, institutional differentiation, is actually what constitutes modernity, and we think of the immanent frame in the Taylor way as this structure interlinking a cosmic order, a social order, in a moral order, all three of them function et si deus non daretur, that's why they are secular, as if God would not exist. A world of science and technology without God, a world of, uh, let's say, horizontal societies, markets, a public sphere of media and democratic states, and a moral order of individual inalienable rights of life, liberty, equality, and the pursuit of happiness. That the precisely these can be globalized without undermining religion. On the contrary, this is the condition of possibility, this immanent frame for all types of religious consciousness to coexist with secularity. But for the immanent frame to, uh, to be institutionalized in the first place, uh, it may have been necessary for a form of secularization that is not so much a spatial differentiation of religion and secularity where both can coexist. By, by the kind of a temporal notion of a stadial consciousness that allow to get rid of religion for the sake of constructing the secular structure. What I'm saying is that in Europe, what you find is that the secular and the religious do not appear as two spatial simultaneous spaces, but actually as two temporal uh, realities, the one after another. So secularity appears as the after religion. And so it is this stadial consciousness which is so dominant in European societies that to become secular means to leave religion behind. And this is, we could say, the price that European Christianity paid for precisely the institutionalization of an immanent frame that once it becomes globalized, allows all religions of humanity to coexist perfectly uh, within this immanent frame. So. Well, look, I mean, Historically, modernity was born in Europe uh, for reasons that historians, I think, can explain or at least describe, and there's no way of getting around that. This whole modern thing, science and technology, I think, being at the core of it, and the rationality that goes with this, were created in Europe and diffused in various ways through empire, colonialism, trade, propaganda, education, whatever, uh, globally. Fine. But um, uh, it is not a necessary package the same as it occurred in Europe. Now, uh, a book that I wrote with two other people, one of them my wife, um, uh, in the 80s, is called The Homeless Mind, Modernization and Consciousness. We didn't yep. talk about religion at all in that book, hardly at all. But we made a distinction we think is useful. We got it from Ivan Illich, by the way, with whom I worked in the, in the, in the 80s. Um, extrinsic and intrinsic packages. An intrinsic package is where a number of things necessarily go together, extrinsic is not. And uh, I, uh, I think I used an example in that book, it was an experience I had in Africa. I was flying with, um, no longer exists, East African Airways. And uh, I, I flew from Entebbe in Uganda to Nairobi. And I, uh, I'm not changing the subject. I'm trying to respond to you. Uh, uh, and I was very, it was at six in the morning. I was half asleep. And I got on the plane. And it was like 
entering an African village. I mean, they had the soundtrack with, with drums of African music. The, the uh, 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 flight attendants were dressed in sort of African clothes. The decor was sort of African. And I sat down and looked around. And, you know, I'm in an African village. I said, my God, who is flying this plane? <laughs> and it wasn't the racist. I mean, I didn't care that, about the pilots. <laughs> skin color. I wanted this guy to be trained exactly like a British Airways or a United Airlines pilot. And then the pilot came on, speaking on the welcoming us on this flight, and clipped British accent. And I was relieved, okay? Uh, the plane is not likely to crash. Now what does that mean? I then reflected about it. You cannot have an African, a culturally African way of flying an aeroplane. For example, African sense of time, which in many ways is more humane, I think, than a modern sense of time. It's more relaxed, it's more human, it's more uh, joyous in a way. If you fly by that time, the plane will crash. So that's an <laughs> intrinsic package. You cannot have a modern airline flying by African cultural styles of temporality. But how you, what you do in the cabin is a different matter. You can have African music, African dress, African food. They had sort of African food. And even sort of African relations between the people in the plane that can be much more relaxed and, and again, humane than is typical in Western societies. That's an extrinsic package. And that, for me, became a kind of, uh, uh, long before I thought about what I'm thinking about now, pluralism, etc., as a very useful way of looking at it. There are, if you want a modern society, there are some uh, requirements which are uh, obligatory, and some that are not. And in a way, uh, the political wisdom is to be able to distinguish which is which. Now, we didn't think about religion at the time, but it applies to religion as much as to anything else. As you can see, Peter Berger is a great storyteller. He always likes to tell stories, jokes also. And you should look for his book, Redeeming Laughter, a fantastic book on humor and the relation of humor and transcendence and meaning in life. Um, I'm going to open up the floor for discussion. I will gather questions because probably there are many, many questions. So I will gather, I already see three. Let's take these three questions and they will, four and let them all go to the next one. So first, second, third, fourth. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Jacha I'm Audrey. I'm from uh, Amdiya Muslim Community. And thank you very much You're for from the Amdiya Muslim Community. And uh, thank you very much for your lecture. And uh, I know you're a very great uh, writer. And um, I can say the uh, uh, pluralistic society and the dead you have mentioned, like the religiously dead people, are revived so many times. In, if you look back in the history, uh, at the time of Moses, at the time of Jesus, at the time of Muhammad, uh, these dead people were revived. And the pluralistic society was unified. And we are hoping, and we are also, uh, the MDA Muslim community believe that the second coming of Messiah had happened. And so this second coming is going to unify the, uh, the, the society. And I can see the Islamic moder modernity will be used to unify the society. And this is my... Okay, thank you, the lady. Um, my name's Connie Burtka, and I have a background in geology and theology, and uh, used to direct the program of Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion at AAAS, so just a little bit so you know where the question's coming from. Um, I'm wondering if you can help me understand the difference or, or the similarity, because as, as I hear you speaking, it sounds maybe they're going in the same place, between your thoughts on pluralism and Norris and Engelhardt's revised theory of secularization, because I, I thought I, if I heard you right, you're, you're arguing that the rise in Pentecostalism 
around the world and evangelicalism um, is actually an entrance into modernity, if I got that right. Um, and that seems actually similar to me from a different angle in what Norris and Engelhardt are saying when they try to look at the variation in religion around the world and they correlate it to, to what they call existential security or lack thereof. So that's, that's my first part of the question is, are you actually both going in the same direction with this? And then secondly, if that's true, um, would the prediction be that once you use evangelicalism and, and, and Pentecostalism as an entrance into modernity and you get there, do you end up going the route of mainstream religions, say in the US, that actually are on decline? I mean, is there, is, there some, is there some prediction that still comes out of this? Thank you. Yes, um, I'm Michael Minkenberg. I'm a political scientist from Germany visiting here for a few months. And uh, I really like your talk a lot, especially the effort to go beyond uh, the classical or the variations of the classical idea of modernity. But I have a few questions, two questions, basically. I'll keep it short. First, go back to your initial statement uh, about the correlates of the institutional differentiation and the differentiation in the mind. I wonder if they're really correlates. I wonder if really the one dichotomy can be translated into the other. I can think of actually a cross-cutting logic here where you have a state that is religious or secular, and you can also have churches that perform purely secular functions and are hollow shells, uh, and then religious churches. So in that way, how far can we go in, in using correlates of binary codes like this to explain social uh, change uh, that you want to do. And the other question I have is um, the modernity concept, and that's also a very political science concern that I have, is uh, if you take this step further, the multiple modernities, you don't even have, uh, n not just in Swedish-Spanish difference, you can take this and say there is a Bavarian modernity and, uh, and the Prussian or Berlin modernity, and you can even within Berlin, you have different kinds of modernity. So where, where do we get with this? And isn't there a bottom line to what it means to be modern that uh, you need to keep, you need to safeguard against the disaggregation of the concept? I mean it more. I will try to keep my question simple. In the context of what you've said about um, evolving notions of modernity. How has your thinking evolved over the years about the institution of marriage? I wrote the book on the family with his wife, so he should know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one well. question there for the next, you are the first for the next round. That covers a lot of ground, I <laughs> couldn't possibly do. Uh, look, on Islam as a unifying force, I think every Muslim of whatever uh, variety of Islam uh, believes that Islam is a religion which affects all of life and uh, can serve as a principle of justice and the desirable social order uh, in, in the world. But that does not answer the question how uh, uh, different social institutions should relate to Islam. And as you well know, I mean, this is a ex burning issue right now. I mean, just think of the, uh, Egypt, what's happening in Egypt right now. Think of what happened in Turkey, uh, what happened in Indonesia, which I find extremely interesting. And one could talk about this at great length, but there are uh, a lot of people uh, in the Muslim world who are thinking about this, I think, in very creative ways. Uh, I could give you something, I don't want to tell too many stories, but um, the yeah. um, story occurs to me from Indonesia, but what? You are good at it. You want a story? Yes. <laughs> okay, I think Indonesia, uh, uh, in terms of, <laughs> of uh, uh, attempts at democracy and Islam, Turkey and Indonesia right now are the most interesting places. Uh, uh, and in Indonesia, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Robert Hefner, is an expert on Indonesia, and he was very friendly with a um, man who died a few years ago, um, Abdurrahman Wahid, uh, who was a, a leader of a large Muslim organization. Um, um, and also the president. 
Pardon me? It was the president of Indonesia. Yeah, he was not a very good president and an argument why intellectuals should not become heads of state. But he was a very interesting thinker and a lovely human being. And um, I remember I had a conversation with him and he, we talked about religious freedom. And he said, oh, he believes in religious freedom. He quoted all the, all the um, passages from the Quran which says there should be no, well, one passage, no coercion in matters of religion. Uh, and he believes in that. And, then uh, we asked him some questions. I said, well, what about um, uh, oh, on, on Islam and, and the modern world? We asked him, what about banks, uh, interest? Uh, in fact, his organization uh, got some Malay, ethnic Malay people, young men, to be interns in Chinese banks so they would learn modern banking, which is not Islamic banking. And um, uh, he said, oh, he said, uh, the prophet, uh, was not against interest, he was against usury, which means uh, unreasonable and cruel interest, but ordinary interest is fine. And then he added, in any case, he said, the Quran is not a textbook of modern economics. And he went on with similar answers. And then I asked him well, the most difficult question, uh, what about um, religious freedom? Does it include the right of a Muslim to uh, leave Islam and join another religion? which under traditional Islamic law is a capital offense. And he said, well, uh, he would greatly deplore this person's decision. He would try to dissuade him from it, but it's his right and he should not be stopped. Well, I mean, that's a mindset. This is not a secular type at all. He, well, he's, he's dead now, but he prayed five times a day. He, he did the pilgrimage to Mecca. He was a pious Muslim in a rather traditional way. Uh, and yet, he had a whole discourse which was secular, involving economics, involving the law, and found a way of reconciling this. So, uh, and that's all I can say at the moment. In terms of Inglehart and Norris, who asked that? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I don't uh, think the way they do. And I haven't analyzed their stuff in great detail, but I think uh, they're wrong. And um, the uh, a case which is uh, in their material, which I found extremely interesting, was the way they deal with Japan. Japan is a theoretically pivotal case. Why? Because it's the first non-Western society that successfully modernized in an amazingly short period of time following the Meiji Restoration and became in a few years more modern than much of Europe. In fact, in 1905, managed to defeat Russia <laughs> on land and on the sea, one of the great European powers. Uh, uh, and still, even today, while it has changed, it is still unmistakably different from uh, Europe or the West. Um, they put, um, uh, and of course, it's a very affluent society, meets their criteria of people who are happy and feel secure don't, are not religious. And they, using, I think, very misleading survey data, classified Japan as a secular society, uh, which I think anyone who knows anything about Japan knows this is wrong. And I can uh, tell you a story. We had a project in Japan a few years ago uh, with, it was a, uh, with a, a Japanese anthropologist led the study, which in a, it said nothing to do with religion. She dealt with and the new individualism in the Japanese economy. Uh, interesting woman, I an mean, anthropologist, um, Kuniko Miyanaga is her name. And uh, we, uh, I was in Tokyo with her and we went for, were going for a walk and she was explaining how secular Japan was. She bought, bought into Inglehart and Norris's idea of Japan. And we walked through a little park uh, in front of a Buddhist temple. And I noticed something I couldn't understand. There were little dolls in the ground, so just the heads of dolls uh, with either, I don't know if they had a body, if they had a body it was in the ground and the heads were sitting there planted in that garden. And I said, what is this? I said, oh, she said, this is a custom, uh, Japan had a very, I think still has a very liberal abortion regime <coughs> and women who've had abortions feel guilty and they want to assuage the kami, the soul of the aborted children. So they put these heads over there, which contain the souls of the aborted fetuses as a, an attempt to assuage their spirits. 
if that is not supernaturalism, I don't know what is. <laughs> While she was talking about how secular Japan is. So uh, Inglehart and Norris, no, I do not um, agree with this. Now, um, uh, you, uh, you also ask what would one predict on the basis of the way I look at things. Well, look, uh, it's very difficult to predict any detail in the future. I mean, uh, for example, I would, while well, Pentecostalism is absolutely amazing as a phenomenon, I'm not, I wouldn't dare predict what it will look like 50 years from now. It may change dramatically. The one prediction which I feel confident in making, I don't think the world is going to be increasingly as Inglehart and Norris <laughs> think it will. Uh, there is no reason to think that. And uh, uh, I would only half jokingly say, uh, look for the next big charismatic explosion in Scandinavia. Uh, uh, it is probably the most secularized region of the world and there are all kinds of things going on. In fact, the presence of Islam is a significant factor. The Swedes don't know how to deal with all these Muslims who play, pray on street corners in Stockholm. Uh, there's a charismatic thing happening in Sweden. Uh, um, okay, I, enough of this. I had two more questions. Um, um, oh, the, uh, the, the um, correlation of uh, consciousness and institutions. Um, well, I, I don't know exactly what you mean by your question. I, I don't, uh, well, you had two questions. The one on, on uh, uh, consciousness and institutions. I'm not suggesting that this is a correlate in the sense of a mirror image. Uh, we know from social psychology, we know how the first socialization of a child occurs. And it occurs by the institutionalized structures of the child's environment becoming internalized within the child. That is the primeval correlation of institution and consciousness. And that uh, continues throughout life. Uh, it's very difficult to find yourself in a strong institutional context without being affected by it in your own mind. So I could go on about this at great length, but it's not a mirror image. It's a, I would say, a dialectical process between the institutions and institutions as they change and what occurs in the individual's consciousness. On Bavaria and uh, Prussia, yes, I quite agree with you. I'm Austrian, my wife is Prussian. And uh, <laughs> there are some, <laughs> some wonderful jokes about Berliners in Bavaria, which I can tell you afterwards. They're not, <laughs> they're, they're not quite uh, uh, kosher uh, uh, in a Jesuit institution. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, even within, uh, within uh, Germany, there are, uh, certainly between Austria and Germany, there are significant differences. Uh, but that doesn't, uh, I don't know what one does with that. I mean. Uh, every uh, cultural phenomenon is variegated. And even within, you said, even within Berlin there are differences. Even within Vienna there are differences. Well, yes, sure. But uh, uh, to use a concept which uh, statistically oriented social scientists like Engelhardt love is frequency distribution, okay? Uh, there are Swedes uh, with uh, black hair and there are Sicilians with, who are blonde, but what's the frequency distribution? And to say that blondness is more prevalent in Sweden than in Sicily uh, makes sense, is empirically a supportable statement, even if you don't absolutize it. Now what your intention is with marriage, I, I don't know. I mean, um, marriage is a... Uh, uh, if people talk about traditional marriage today, what they're really talking about is bourgeois marriage. It's the marriage, the, 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 the institution and the ideology that went with the institution that is roughly as old as the steam engine, little older, 18th century. The rising bourgeoisie as against the aristocracy and against the peasantry uh, developed a particular form of marriage which you can describe, rather individuated, with um, uh, 
uh, feminists don't like this, but I think it's true, with increasingly respected status of women, uh, with a very specific notion about the importance of the child. Um, well, that was created in Europe uh, in, in early modern period. Uh, uh, and continues today and has f become very successful internationally. Uh, people all over the world find it attractive. Pearl Buck, by the way, who wrote about China, had a very nice novel. What is it? One novel I forget I read years ago, which describes uh, the modernization of a traditional Chinese woman who had bound feet and sort of, and marries this modern doctor who tries to modernize her, and she, to please him, she unbinds her feet. And uh, uh, In other words, uh, uh, this bourgeois European marriage has been quite successfully exported, and we can describe its values, which seem attractive to a lot of people who are not European. Uh, I think individuation has much to do with this. It presupposes a certain individuation. Uh, in uh, uh, in the marriage, I don't know what else you intended me to say. I mean, uh, okay, so we'll go to the next round. So we have a gen one, two, three, four. Okay, and then we'll go to the third round if there is time. Okay, please, uh, Bob Shadler. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, in a way, my question expands the previous question, in the sense that you can have pluralism in your mind, but when you want to express it in society, um, do you find there are limits to that pluralism? And is that part of your exploration? In other words, for a society to cohere, one may think you need some areas in common, perhaps even common taboos, um, and a, a bit of a, a anecdote as a former scout leader in Spring Valley, which is even more liberal than Georgetown, uh, we had most of our boys from single parent families, women highly educated, highly income, who uh, were probably very tolerant socially, but they were desperate for male role models. And w I then was wondering, could you imagine two men taking 12 boys out, or 12 girls out for camping every month the way our troop did, and what would be the reaction, not in terms of gay rights, but just in terms of people are people. But, but, over, but the question is really, the, the, once you have this dual mind or pluralistic mind within yourself, you, some of it, particularly religious things, often want to be expressed and they come into conflict and pluralism, so does pluralism then have its limits or, or not? Okay, uh, my name is Joel Eidelbaum. I'm with the Fulbright Association at the present time. Uh, sir, I'm really impressed by your breadth of, and depth. I'd like to get you back to Weber. Uh, Weber, the mine shop, the cell uh, shop, Durkheim, uh, mechanical and organic solidarity, are these not the very same proto-concepts for your pluralism versus the old-fashioned kind of uh, society? And secondly, sacred and profane, your religion versus secular, although profane has specific meanings in this context, uh, particularly for Catholics and many other uh, religious groups. But it's more considered amoral, whereas moral is with the sacred. And then bring it forward to, how shall I put it, the social thinkers like Ernst Gellner, who are also, by the way, anthropologists as well as philosophers, and even, God forbid, an anthropologist named Geertz, and see if you can interpret those thinking ways into your concept of modernity, not versus secularity, but encompassing both religion and secularity. Okay. Sorry to be so obtuse. No, I, 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 I know these guys that you're talking about. <laughs> and they know you. Well, they are dead, so. <laughs> <laughs> Voila. 
Hi. First of all, I wanted to thank you very much for your, your uh, observations and your presentation uh, today. My name is Susan Taylor, and I'm with the National Affairs Office of the Church of Scientology here in Washington. Um, a very practical question. Um, uh, taking into account your observations and your theories and with the increasing restrictions of religious freedom, um, say in European countries, especially since uh, like Russia in the last few months and, and the year or so, um, and these trends that are going on, what do you see their, the future of these countries? Yes. The next, we'll get the next round down there in the back. So, please. Hi, my name is Shelvin Anton. I'm a Lebanese journalist in the social. Uh, my question is, uh, how can we reach a theory of pluralism without having a at least common ground on the notion of uh, tolerance? Tolerance. Thank you. Um. To answer all of these questions adequately, I would have to be a Renaissance man. And while I. Is what you are. Uh, no, no. Uh, 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 megalomania has not been one of my virtues. So, um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll try. Um, are there limits to pluralism? Absolutely, yes. Uh, and there, Durkheim, whom you mentioned, uh, is quite relevant. I mean, I think Durkheim was right. A society, in order to survive, must have what he calls a collective conscience. In Fren Fr French, interestingly, in old Romance languages, conscience and consciousness are the same word. And you took him as usually translated as collective consciousness, which I think is a mistake. It's collective conscience he was talking about. In other words, every society must have a number of basic normative uh, values which everyone either, if, if possible, actually believes in, and if not, is forced to act accordingly. If that didn't happen, society would fall apart. Beginning with the most obvious one, you can, can't have a society survive if every dispute between individuals ends up in lethal violence. But there's a lot of other things. I mean, there have to be agreement on certain aspects of sexual behavior, of economic behavior, of, of the limits of, the, of political power, uh, that goes without saying. Uh, absolutely, there must be limits to pluralism. The difficult question is what these limits are. And uh, we talk about uh, culture war in the United States, which I think is a, is a reality, although some uh, people have denied it. Usually people who are themselves very much part of that war. Uh, 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 yes, I mean, uh, you mentioned the Boy Scouts, the issue of gay scout leaders. Uh, that is a, where does pluralism end? And uh, people don't agree on this. On the other hand, American society has a Durkheimian values, joint value system, which is quite remarkable. And uh, um, while, uh, yes, there are very sharp conflicts over issues like homosexuality and a list of others, uh, which are fought over in the courts and in public demonstrations and elections and whatnot. Uh, there's remarkably little physical violence involved, which is not true of much of the world. So a society in which people can argue about things like should there be gay scout leaders and argue it in court rather than with machine guns is a society which has uh, uh, core values, which um, uh, organize pluralism uh, without um, uh, abandoning it. Um, you mentioned, uh, by the way, the Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft is not Weber, it's Tönnies. Uh, but Weber would mm, say something similar. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you, I would put your question in more general terms, to what extent is classical sociologist still useful to develop our concept of modernity. And I think it's very useful. I think both uh, the Tönnies distinction between Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, Durkheim, you mentioned it, organic and mechanical solidarity, Weber's concept of, ration, of rationality and rationalization, those are useful concepts even today. Um, with, in conceptualizing modernity. 
And uh, Weber also was, I think, very useful in distinguishing between different types of rationality. And I think we have to ask what kind of rationality is most central to modernity. And I would say it's the rationality of the scientist and the engineer. And then in a kind of derivative way of the bureaucrat. It's rational orderings, uh, in a way. Weber also saw this. Uh, wonderful essay on bureaucracy. Um, not the kind we have today. But no, the kind we have today. I mean, th this is not a value judgment. I mean, there can be awful bureaucracies, but nevertheless, they organize life in a very rational way. And one thing in which I'm very Weberian, I believe in value-free social science. Uh, doesn't mean the scientist doesn't have, social scientist doesn't have values. If he didn't have values, he'd be a monster. But uh, <laughs> relevant structure. While I'm doing sociology, uh, I'm not supposed to bring into sociology my own political, moral, and religious values. Uh, in terms of sociology of religion, I've never had any problem with this. Uh, my religious views have hardly changed since my youth. I'm, as I like to put it, I'm incurably Lutheran. Uh, <laughs> but I don't have to bring this into my analysis of uh, church-state relations in Russia or in the United States. Or, okay. Um, what else have we got but here? Uh, how do you relate to more modern so things like Gellner? Well, Gellner has, been a great in, has not been a great influence on me. I don't, um, frankly, I don't, I don't know his work that well. last book of his I've read is his very nasty <laughs> analysis of Oxford philosophers which is probably quite accurate, but um, uh, I, I, I can't. But the Saints of the Atlas and his idea of the Muslim world as well. I'm afraid I'm not very familiar with that. Um, can't read my own writing, pluralism and... Okay. Well, thank you. And what and was... The Scientology. No, but you didn't ask about Scientology. Yes. Uh, uh, was Oh, uh, tolerance. Oh, oh, is there uh, religious freedom and tolerance? Is there a trend? Uh, tolerance was the Muslim. One was basically under restrictions of religious freedom in Europe, and the next one was an, an tolerance. And tolerance. I see. Okay. Uh, in Europe, uh, you have to distinguish between European countries. It's quite different. And uh, Grace Davy, who I think is one of the best sociologists of religion around, she's British. She's also, by the way, a lay canon in the Church of England, which is interesting. But you wouldn't know that from reading her sociological <coughs> works. Uh, uh, she has written a lot about Europe. And she now spends half the year in Sweden every year. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, we have very different situations. And some are similar to the United States, some are not. Um, uh, I write a blog once a week on religion and other curiosities, I call it, and I compared, it was a couple of weeks ago, a number of cases that came to the Supreme Court, of uh, federal courts in the U.S. and came before the European uh, Court of, what is it, Human Rights or something in Strasbourg. They were very similar. It had to do with uh, whether people can wear uh, religious insignia while they're in doing uh, public service of some kind. Uh, and some are different. I mean, they, they, uh, there's still an establishment of the Church of England. Uh, there is a religious regime in France which is quite different from any other European. Well, Belgium is similar, but uh, quite different from Germany. Uh, um, so I don't think you can uh, generalize on this. Uh, I think on the whole, uh, Western Europe and North America have very strong protections for religious freedom may be frayed at the edges, there may be debates on the edges, but I think uh, it, it would be very, very a lack of sense of proportion to compare uh, Europe and, well, at least Western and Central Europe and North America with, I don't know, Iran or, or uh, North Korea. Or, this would be a lack of proportion. Uh, um, and in terms of the Islam question, I mean, uh, I, I can only repeat what I said before. I mean, there are very different notions within the Muslim world as to the limits of pluralistic tolerance. And uh, I've, I'm f take the Turkish example, which I find very interesting. I have a colleague who's a specialist on 
not not only on Turkish Islam but on the Islamist party in Turkey, the AKP. <coughs> uh, written very interesting, just came out with an interesting book, uh, Jenny White, Boston University. She's, a, she's an anthropologist, but a Turkish specialist. And um, uh, she um, um, uh, discussed a very interesting, I hadn't heard this before, she mentioned it, uh, what people say in the uh, Islam, uh, Islamist party. They say, uh, from the prime minister on down, we don't want an Islamic state. We want to be good Muslims in a secular state. It's an astonishing statement. Now you talk to Kemalis and they don't mean it. They don't mean it. Sooner or later they want to stone adulterers and cut off the hands of thieves. Uh, um, well, there are quite a few of them. Some of them probably don't mean it. Uh, some of them do mean it. And that's very interesting. And that's a notion of Islam and tolerance, which some people think um, works. Now, we'll see how it works. If you look at Islamic history, there were periods of great tolerance. Uh, certain periods of uh, Muslim rule in Spain, so-called, what is it, conviviencia between convivencia. Muslims, Jews, and Christians, and places like Cordoba, uh, some periods of Mughal rule in India, uh, some aspects of the uh, uh, millet system in Turkey. It uh, wasn't like religious freedom in the United States, but it had some aspects of pluralism, of tolerance. Time to two questions. There were two at the back, and yes, the two questions, and, and then we'll go. So please. First, the gentleman, the young. Oh, okay. One, and then the other. Dr. Berger, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Evan Barry from American University, and my question is about um, maybe what we could call the differentiation of individual consciousness. Uh, uh, differentiation of what? Individual consciousness. It seems to me like uh, where we might see inst uh, uh, differentiation happening in institutional spheres, it's relatively systematic. There are clear legal partitions between church and state and so forth. Uh, that kind of systematicity doesn't really map on to uh, the individual psyche. Uh, we, we're internally contradictory people all of the time. And I think what's so interesting about the, the line of analysis you're pursuing is uh, what, you, what you're sort of identifying spheres of relevance where people move back and forth uh, from time to time. It reminds me actually of uh, John Rawls' position on the movement from private reasons to public reasons. We sort of uh, use different kinds of discourse in different circumstances and we become, we gain a fluency in that kind of movement. So my question is a sort of method methodological one. Uh, is your uh, work, in your forthcoming work, uh, aimed more at describing the ways that individuals might move between internally differentiated spheres or is it more uh, a characterization of contemporary social movements as a way of sort of predicting this is, this is why global Pentecostalism is so successful, precisely because it allows individuals uh, the kind of joint uh, articulation of economic, rational interests and supernatural ones. So I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much. And I think this question, my name is Ken Dante, and my background is in psychotherapy. And it's sort of a related question because it's more about what's healthy in religion more than just what's successful. And when I look at institutions, some of them are not particularly healthy for individuals. They may exist across generations, but the, you know, the health of the individual, the health of the quest, the health of the spirit may not necessarily be there. What are some of your thoughts about how to encourage that amongst cultures and maybe how to differentiate, not between good and bad religions, but good and bad religion within religions? <laughs> Okay. Um, the question on uh, differentiation in consciousness, I don't quite get the alternative. You say descriptive or predictive. Uh, the way I understand social science, it is description. It is not uh, normative. When I'm a sociologist, I don't <coughs> preach. Uh, I predict, yeah, sometimes I can 
make some very tentative predictions in terms of what I see. But I found I've made predictions where I was very wrong. So I mean, uh, predictions should be made within a social science context very cautiously. Uh, so I don't quite get. It's not the difference. Well, I would say it is a anthropological constant, which came up in a number of questions that were raised. It's an anthropological constant, probably was true as soon as Homo sapiens climbed off the tree and got on his hind legs and said, I'm a human. Um, uh, uh, namely, that there is a dialectical relationship between the individual mind and the social environment. Uh, I think that's intrinsic to the constitution of Homo sapiens. Uh, but um, uh, in, in, uh, specific relationships differ from uh, in terms of situations. Now movements, I don't know what kind of movements you had in mind. If someone adheres to a movement and allows that movement or to sort of dominate uh, his or her life, um, yeah, then, then there will be an internalization of that movement within the individual's mind. I don't know what else to say. Um, but then other things one could say about the nature of institutions. Uh, Arnold Galen's theory of institutions I found very useful, uh, but I don't, this is not the place for it. Uh, in terms of um, what's healthy and what's not <coughs> healthy, what is good or bad religion, uh, I cannot deal with this within the context of social science as I understand it. Uh, uh, good or bad are value judgments, uh, which I'm perfectly prepared to make, but then I have to say I'm not now speaking as a sociologist. And I have very strong views on morality, on politics, on religion. But uh, I have to bracket them when I do social science. Otherwise, I'm doing propaganda, and there's no reason why anybody should listen to me. Uh, all I have to, well, they may listen because I'm eloquent or they share my values, but any contribution I can make as a social scientist is, use the term description, can I correctly describe, uh, explain, occasionally predict what is going on. Um, and healthy, well, I don't know. To me, much of the, I mean, if you're talking about physical health, uh, yes, that can be done in a value-free way. I think if somebody says it's, it's not good for a 20-year-old to weigh 300 pounds, uh, that's not just a value statement. I think that's a medical uh, uh, diagnosis and to some extent a prediction. But when you get into psychotherapy and into uh, uh, these areas of human behavior, question of how should I live, uh, I think it's very difficult for me to deal with this as a social scientist, because there are very different notions of how one should live and what is healthy and unhealthy. Uh, many things I like to do are clearly unhealthy, and I still want to do them. Uh, okay, I don't know what else to say. On this note, thank you very much. Let's thank Peter Berger.